first really starts using the first person with remarkable and dramatic regularity. What Montaigne innovates in the 16th century has become standard fare for us today. In my books, I start with Rousseau, but I could have started with Montaigne. You've got to start somewhere. People keep emailing me and say, why did you start here and not there? Uh, I actually said to one person, one person actually emailed me and said, why did you start with Eve in the garden? Isn't that where the problem really started? Uh, to which my answer was, well, of course. But then the book would have been 100,000 pages long and nobody would have read it. You know, one has to, one has to leave stuff out. That's the art of writing history, I think. Reality TV, I've already mentioned Survivor. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you watch Big Brother that thankfully I've never wasted 25 minutes of my life watching. I'm sure if you watch Big Brother, you would again find a remarkable occurrence of the first person singular in what's being said there. There's also the impact of technology. How does technology fuel this emphasis on I, me, mine, my feelings? Well, first of all, I think it reinforces the idea of human beings as those who can transcend themselves. Technology gives us this feeling that we have great power. Uh, I raised questions about that at lunchtime that I won't go into now, but it seems to me that as technology makes us more powerful, it also makes us more dependent upon technology, and therefore also in an odd way makes us less powerful as well. Uh, I was struck the other day uh, yesterday, in fact, in the airport, where do I choose to sit? I choose to sit by a power socket because I have to sit where it's convenient for my phone, not where it's convenient for me necessarily. Technology also tilts us, I think, towards thinking of nature as just shapeless stuff and then even as a problem. I used to think the problem with technology was that it taught us to think that nature's just shapeless. Actually, I think it also teaches us to think that nature is a problem to be overcome. I don't think transgenderism arises merely in a context where the body is shapeless stuff. I think the body has become a real problem to be overcome. And that's where, I, again, uh, I think I, I missed something in my book that I located transgenderism very narrowly relative to LGBTQ, transgressive sexual revolutionary ideas. I think transgenderism could just as easily take its place within the transhumanism trajectory as well, that sees the body as limited, an external imposition, and therefore as problematic. And if you want to see how deeply that's pervaded our culture, just read the amicus brief in the Dobbs case filed by the, I've forgotten how many there were, but filed by the women uh, professional American athletes. Uh, not so much interested in the pro-abortion argument as I am interested in the way they talk about their bodies. They talk about their bodies as if their bodies were not them, but were tools. They talk about their bodies as I might talk about a pen or as a carpenter might talk about a saw, as something external to them that allows them to become who they truly are. Technology also, and this is where it connects to the sentimentalism and the emotionalism of modern culture, technology also facilitates performance. I think one of the most significant roles of technology today is that has allowed us all to become those who are most ourselves when we perform in public. When you think of the dramatic popularity of YouTube and now TikTok, what is it that makes those things popular? Well, one of the factors is they provide us with a context in which we can perform. They provide us with a context in which we can be those authentic people who act out on our inward thoughts. I would also say, and I'm gonna come back to this in a few moments, I think what technology has done relative to social media is this. 
it is increasingly attenuated if it has not completely dismantled the distinction between the public sphere and the private sphere. And that has had the effect of bringing all of these values and emotions back into the public sphere in an unexpected, dramatic, and problematic way. Symptoms of this sentimental, emotional culture, if those are the causes and the things that facilitate it, symptoms. I think Yuval Levine uh, nails it. My first, uh, the first point I'm gonna draw out is this. Uh, one of the symptoms is a fundamental transformation of institutions. Institutions have gone from being places of formation to places of performance. One of the anecdotes I've told repeatedly uh, over the last year, uh, I tell this to my students, and my students are shocked by this. I remember walking home from school uh, one day. I must have been 14 or 15. I was in school uniform, but I was off school property. And the second master, you would call them the vice principal, and this was just a, what you would call a public school. This was a state-funded school. You had to pass a test to get in, but it was for boys from humble backgrounds to get a sort of elite education at government expense. I'm walking home from school, and my shirt is untucked. And the uh, vice principal, the second master, uh, he's walking towards me, and he stops. He says, stop, boy. Tuck your shirt in. You are bringing the name of the school into public disrepute. That's pretty stunning. I still remember that. That's, that's 40 years ago. That, that was stunning. And I didn't go home and tell mum and dad because I'd have got more than the same from mum and dad. Why do I tell that anecdote? Well, I could put it facetiously, he said, because I didn't go to school to express myself. That wasn't the English grammar school way. English grammar schools existed to crush the individuality of the pupils and to make them part of the team. Second anecdote, when I was graduating from university, very traditional uh, university, on the day of graduation, myself and all my male colleagues had to line up against the chapel wall uh, and raise our pants, that's our trousers, uh, by three or four inches while the head porter, a man in a funeral suit and a bowler hat with a fob watch, uh, and the name, I kid you not, his name was Mr. Monument. If ever there was a name for a terrifying head porter, that was it, walked along the line and inspected the color of our socks. Because if your socks weren't black, you weren't gonna graduate. The point being, I was at University of Cambridge, you're about to have the privilege of becoming a permanent member of the University of Cambridge. The institution is much bigger than you. The institution doesn't need you. You need the institution. You better be part of the team before you're allowed to join. I'm amazed at uh, American graduations, and I've only ever taught in America at pretty conservative institutions. I'm amazed at the fancy displays that take place at graduation where everybody just does their own thing. And it's lovely, I'm not criticizing it, but it represents a very different vision of what an institution is to that which I was schooled in back in the UK. Uh, I remember when we would visit as a family, we would go to places, my mum would always say to me, and you keep quiet, you're the least interesting person in the room. And I love my mom, I got on well with my mom, but again, the institution of the family. There were rules, and it was about formation. It is interesting to me how, in, particularly in America, I, I presume it's similar in the, U in the UK, but I'm not, uh, I'm not there regularly now. I read the, the, the press every day, the UK press every day, but I'm not as familiar with the, the cultural language. But it struck me, watching a couple of debates on television recently, one of them about the introduction of school uniforms to a school in California. I was always a big fan of school uniforms because at my school, you didn't know who the poorest kids were and you didn't know who the rich kids were. Everybody looked the same, and that was great. It was a very equalizing thing. One of the, te one of the parents at this uh, debate made the speech, why can't we let the kids express themselves through their clothing? At which point I wanted to scream at the screen because that's not what school's about. It's about crushing individuality and becoming part of the team. Think about it. 
the parents' vision of education was that their child goes to school to perform, not primarily to be formed. I saw then another debate on uh, whether trans people should serve in the military. And I heard exactly the same phrase. Why shouldn't we allow trans people to express themselves through military service? Set aside the trans issue. I have never been, I've never done any military service. I, one of that blessed generation that grew up and dodged all the wars uh, that, that Britain was involved in. And we've been involved in a lot, by the way. If you look up online, there's that funny map about countries that Britain hasn't been to war with. And I think the North Pole might be the only one or the North Pole in Greenland or something. I've never been on a battlefield, but if I was on a battlefield, I would not want to be with a bunch of people expressing themselves. I would want to be with a group of people who operated as a team, who thought as a team, who fought as a team. When you reach a point where even the military is about self-expression and not about crushing individuality to be part of the team, really institutions have been dramatically transformed. And indeed, Philip Reeve sort of predicts this. Philip Reeve says that as the therapeutic imagination comes to grip people, you'll see a transformation of institutions. And he says, two institutions, to which I would actually add a third, two institutions will decline in cultural importance, and two institutions will rise in cultural importance. The two institutions that decline will be the nation and the church. I would actually add the family to that as well. Why will they decline? Because they demand a sacrifice of the self for something bigger than themselves. That's half of the therapeutic equation. Which institutions will rise in prominence? Reef says, theater and hospital. Theater and hospital. Because they both, in their different ways, make you feel good. Theater stops you being bored, and by theater, I think we can include TikTok, YouTube, etc., etc. And the hospital dulls the pain involved with being a physical human being, subject to the illnesses and the weaknesses of human beings. Go back to the 2012 uh, Olympics. I was in Australia at the time, but I watched the opening. Uh, display uh, uh, of Britain where each nation of course when you host the Olympics is you're meant to have an opening uh, celebration that says something important about your history. Uh, I'm there as a sort of unreconstructed uh, uh, British guy from the 70s and 80s hoping that the number of times we beat the French in wars would feature pretty heavily. Uh, as far as I remember there were no victories over the French celebrated. What we did celebrate was the National Health Service. That struck me as, first of all, it struck me as bizarre. Why would you celebrate a health service necessarily? Every country has one. But then it struck me as akin to the stuff that Reef talks about. As you move into a therapeutic mode, then the institutions of therapy will become the things that people value most the things that make them feel good. We might say the things that help their sentiments be right, move to the center. So the first thing is transformation of institutions. Second thing is, I think, in the therapeutic world, ethics becomes increasingly aesthetics. As you move from material priorities, ownership of property, for example, to psychological priorities, feeling good, you find that ethics starts to focus on feelings too. I ask my students sometimes in class, okay, tell me the language that you would typically use about tweets that, that are wrong. And they'll say, well, we find them offensive or hurtful or distasteful. So that's interesting because none of those statements actually make any claim about whether the tweet or the statement you've heard is right or wrong. They're really references to your aesthetic reaction, your taste reaction, your emotional reaction to what's being said or what is done. And I, to mock myself, I say, you know the statement, 
Truman is a bald guy with crooked teeth. He's deeply hurtful to me, but nonetheless true and correct. You cannot deny that. What fascinates me about virtue signaling is not so much what is signaled, which changes from day to day and week to week, but that there is a signal, a necessary public signal. The culture of performing our emotions in public, which starts as a way of being authentic, shifts to being an imperative in order to show people that you truly belong. The hoo-ha over the pride flag gets sort of more amusing every year because the pride flag is constantly changing. And man, if you're putting last year's pride flag up on your Twitter account, then you're excluding people. It is not just that you have to gesture support, you have to gesture the support of today, but you have to gesture it. You could be somebody who treats everybody you meet with utter contempt. But as long as you perform in the right way on social media, as long as you press the right emotional buttons, you're okay. Politics becomes aesthetics. It's amazing to me how, uh, and I think I've always felt this about American politics since I arrived compared to British politics. It always seemed to be much more obsessed with appearance than with argument. I suspect British politics has shifted in the American direction. Politics in America has always seemed to me about the aesthetics of the strong man. The president is key. And it's often not the policies so much as the performed qualities that seem so important. I'm working on something else at the moment. I'm working on refuting the idea that evil is banal. You know, that famous claim by Hannah Arendt when she was at uh, Adolf Eichmann's trial in the early 1960s in Jerusalem, and she gave those reports, I think, for the New Yorker that ultimately became a little, brilliant little book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a study in the banality of evil. And I think she's right that Eichmann was banal, but he didn't become evil because of banality. And, and in order to do this, I, I watched The Triumph of the Will a couple of times recently. Lainey Riefenstahl's famous propaganda movie from, I think it came out in 1935, but it was the 1934, immediate post uh, Night of the Long Knives, Nazi shenanigans. It's the movie of the Nuremberg rallies. It's a powerful movie. Uh, it's, it's, it's listed on Amazon, but not available through Amazon. You have to dig deep uh, into the archives online to find it. And I was Amazon has it as, you know, the triumph of the will, starring Adolf Hitler. <laughs> I, I can't put my finger on why that's wrong, but it struck me as there's got to be a way of, better way of expressing uh, his role. It also listed it under the contemplative movie category. Uh, I think Amazon really needs to sort out its movie category algorithms because it is not a contemplative movie. What was shocking about Triumph of the Will, and, what was and it is a disturbing movie, what was disturbing to me, though, was not the overt German nationalism and the thinly disguised anti-Semitism. What shocked me was so much of the technique of the triumph of the will is what you find on every party political broadcast or movie today. There's a lot of hoo-ha recently about uh, the sort of the fascist aesthetics of uh, Joe Biden's speech where he went after Donald Trump's supporters, I think, fairly, fairly vigorously. It was rather weird. It was sort of red and black. And, and there was, a, you know, isn't this very sort of Nazi-like? Well, uh, you could make that case. But I would make the case that Nazi aesthetics, at least as you find them in the triumph of the will, permeate the aesthetics of modern politics right and left because they appeal to emotionally powerful stories and everything is built around them. From the moment Hitler's plane is coming descending through the clouds, you're reminded of the start of the First World War. Then you're reminded that this is 16 years since the great betrayal of Germany and one year since the start of the rebirth. And everything flows from that. It's very, very powerful, very easy to get carried along. Precisely the same sort of narrative techniques and aesthetics that I think have become the stock in trade of an emotional and sentimentally driven politics. 
I would also say it is not banal. Whatever made Adolf Eichmann into a mass murderer, it was not his banality. I think it was the signs, the symbols, the narratives, the feeling of belonging, the vision that Hitler cast. George Orwell's 1940 uh, review of Mein Kampf is fascinating on that front. And he essentially says, do not, put the, do not make the mistake of putting the, uh, the success of Hitler down to him promising prosperity to the German people. He promised them struggle and something worth dying for. He appealed to their profoundest emotions. Science, next, uh, next symptom. Uh, science comes to serve therapy. Medicine's a good example of this. I'll, I'll move through this fairly quickly, but if you look at how the philosophy of medicine has changed over the last 100 years, it's fascinating. Uh, think about plastic surgery. Plastic surgery was developed in, uh, in the aftermath of the First World War in order to allow men who'd been terribly disfigured on the front by mustard gas and whiz bangs, etc., etc., to have some semblance of a face or a body put back together so they could function in society. Medicine was kind of triage, if you like, at that point. Think of how plastic surgery functions now. When you're flying on a plane and you open those glossy in-flight magazines, there's always a plastic surgeon being advertised there. And I'm assuming that if you're buying a one-page ad in a, an in-flight magazine, well, it may not be like buying a one-page ad in the Wall Street Journal, but it costs money. Somebody's paying you not, not to put back together necessarily bodies that have been torn to shreds. Somebody's paying you to allow somebody, that, so somebody's paying you to change their body into that which makes them feel good or feel better about themselves. The facts of medical science and technique now serve the sentiments of the therapeutic culture. Uh, look at how the abortion debate has gone in the days since Dobbs. Uh, science has been dramatically subordinated, it seems to me, to certain narratives that have come into play. Uh, the most controversial podcast, I do a, a, run a, do a small podcast with a friend and we generally focus on church kind of issues. The podcast that we did that generated the most anger uh, was one where I interviewed my friend Adeline Allen, who is a professor of law who specializes in surrogacy law. Interviewed Adeline Allen about in vitro fertilization, uh, to which she is implacably opposed. What struck me about the reactions we got from good conservative Christian people who hated what she had to say was they'd never actually thought out the issue beyond, well, it, it, it makes people feel good. It creates new life and it makes people happy. Missing entirely the point about, well, does it lead us to commodify children? Are there other aspects of IVF that might transform the way we imagine children to be in our society that are actually harmful? in the long run. Not saying that Adeline has all the right answers on that, simply saying it struck me as interesting that people were not even willing to entertain these arguments because their emotional visceral reaction was so strongly against them. Public discourse, I think a fourth symptom. Public discourse collapses in this sentimental age. I'm a particular hater of Twitter. Uh, I don't read it, I don't do it, my youngest son keeps an eye on it in case there's anything I need to know being said about me on Twitter. Other than that, I don't touch it. It is unclean, and it would make me feel unclean. A couple of interesting things about Twitter, though, is it's, it's, it's the perfect medium. It's the perfect medium for an age where emotions drive everything. It always amuses me when, in the UK, an MP would put up something on Twitter, probably at 2 a.m. in the morning, having had too much to drink, and the following day, they realize this is a really bad thing. And their immediate defense is, well, my tweet was taken out of context. To which the response is, tweets have no context. It can't possibly be taken out of context. It's 140 or whatever characters. That's all it is. Twitter is the perfect medium for an emotional age driven by sentiment because you cannot make an argument, or you cannot make an argument worth listening to or worth reading 
in 140 characters. You just can't, or 260, as they expanded the number. You simply can't. I vowed some years ago, I will never go on Twitter, uh, because I remember jokingly saying to a friend, uh, if I'm gonna torch my career, uh, it's gonna be for a paragraph, or maybe even a whole article. It's not gonna be for 140 characters. Uh, I happened to be on a panel this summer at a, at, at a summit with somebody who had torched their career through a tweet, through a tweet. Interestingly enough, they were still on Twitter. Couldn't quite understand that. But it's interesting, isn't it? That Twitter is such a dominant medium for how, particularly, it seems to me, young people think. And I'd also add this, what's interesting about Twitter is how emotional a medium it is. I haven't done many debates, but over the years, I've, I've had a few debates, public debates, with people with whom I dramatically disagree. What has always struck me as interesting about those debates is the temperature has generally gone down in the course of the debate. Because body language is important. Those things you whisper aside, you'll whisper to each other between speeches. You'll make a joke, you'll make some self-deprecating comment. All of these things serve to lower the temperature of debates generally. It's interesting to me on Twitter, it seems that the tendency is always to raise the temperature and raise the tension and to exacerbate the problem of a culture built on emotion. Such that politics, I've coined this phrase this afternoon, I don't know if it works or not, can we now think of politics and political debate as the dialectics of the dim-witted, where each side makes the other side more stupid because they have nothing worthwhile saying themselves. They simply emote. Chatting to somebody just last week, a strong, committed Democrat who said to me, and I'm, I'm not American, so I'm not a member of any political party over here, said, I, the Democrats are stupid, she said, and I blame the Republicans because they've become so stupid, she said. Nobody has to make an intelligent argument anymore. And it's destroyed both sides. Emotion, aesthetics. All of these things that play to our sentimental age are so damaging. Is there a way forward? Well, I'm a historian, not a philosopher or somebody who proposes solutions, but I'll make a, a brief attempt here. I think if there is a way forward, it, we have to, in some way, recover the notion of culture as that which directs us outwards and which does not pander to and must be made to conform to our inner feelings and desires. The recovery of external authority in some shape or form needs to take place. That may mean that we need to form alternative institutions. Uh, there are some who are calling for a wholesale creation of alternative institutions. I'm not sure that that's possible. Uh, I was a pastor for some years. I was a pastor at the time uh, Rod Dreher's Benedict Option came out. I remember talking to Rod about it and saying, you know, uh, the Benedict Option has a lot of things that I think are important and a lot of things that are attractive. But at the end of the day, most of my congregants are so enmeshed in society that simply withdrawing and forming alternative communities is not really possible. People have mortgages, they have student loans. Not everybody has the luxury of sending their kids to a private school. Not everybody has the luxury of homeschooling. Certain parts of the Protestant community I've seen have said, if you don't homeschool your kids, you're lazy. Well, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you're so poor that mum has to go out to work just to put bread on the table. And the public school is the only viable option. It's not easy simply to withdraw and form alternative institutions. But I think some are necessary and important. And time may be coming when alternative educational institutions become significant. We also have to find a way, though, of navigating life in this world. How can we do that? Well, I think it has to start locally. Where can I make a difference? Where can you make a difference? I cannot make a difference in Washington. Pennsylvania is a sort of swing state, so if I get a vote, maybe I can make a slight difference in Pennsylvania. If I lived in Massachusetts, that wouldn't apply. But if I lived in Massachusetts, I could still make a difference in my own home. Family, home, local community. This is where we can cultivate 
the kind of frameworks that shaped medieval communities. This is where we could perhaps make some forms of external authority plausible again. What else might we do? Well, it sounds trite to say it, but I think to beware of critical problems is the first step to addressing them. How many of us have ever bothered to reflect upon how technology shapes how we think about the world? How many of you have ever bothered to reflect that, wow, I chose that seat in the airport because it was near a power plug, so my cell phone is running my life, not the other way around? I spent a lot of time this last year giving talks on rapid onset gender dysphoria and the scourge it is uh, of society at the moment, and one of the points I've made to parents is, don't give your children a cell phone. I don't care where you send your kids to school or if you homeschool them. If you give them a smartphone, this may be a cell phone's over If you give them a smartphone, the most influential people in your children's lives are not you and they're not their teachers. They're the crazy people on TikTok. It's fascinating, isn't it, that TikTok, as far as I can understand, is owned by China, but the Chinese are very restrictive in how they allow their own young people to use TikTok. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but that's an interesting fact. Chinese seem to understand what TikTok does to notions of authority and does to young people. We need to learn, I think, and we need to cultivate a reconnection of fact and value. I'm very taken with the work that uh, Carter Sneed and Erica Bakayoki have done uh, in ethics over the last few years arguing for a fundamental reconfiguration of understanding what it means to be human as being marked by obligation and dependency. Became a grandfather just seven or eight months ago. It's a wonderful thing to hold a grandchild in your arms. I'd always thought that Psalm 188, 128, may you live to see your children's children, was just a wish that you would live a long time. But no, it's actually a peculiar blessing to hold life, that life that you have created has in turn created. It's a remarkable thing. And it's a point of natural obligation as well. Often amused by that question, you see two people drowning, your own child and somebody else's child out at sea, who do you save first? To me the answer is obvious, I save my own child first. Not because I'm selfish, but because I have a natural obligation to that child, which is more attenuated when it comes to a child in general, we might say. We need to rethink the world in a way that places natural obligations and dependencies at the center. We need, in short, to reshape the imagination in a manner that presents us with larger realities than ourselves. That has to start in the home, I think. Can we do that? Well, that's the question with which I now leave you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> We have a few minutes for uh, questions, so um, if you raise your hand, I will bring this mic around and ask folks to pass it if we need to. So, yeah. That was marvelous, and I don't mean to put a damper on it, but, but I want to go to your solutions. Isn't the genie out of the lamp? I mean, I, I don't know how we get back to trying to create authority again and yeah. the, the solutions you've talked about. Can, is there an interim step you could talk about? Is, it, it, yes, we should go to where you're talking yeah. about. But how do we go from where we are to there? Yeah, I think the problem with, the problem with saying isn't the, genie out of, uh, isn't the genie out of the lamp at this point, that can lead to despair, which can just lead to impotence and doing nothing. Uh, and at a minimum, I, I, I've quoted it's not in the books, I don't think, but it is in the Lord of the Rings movies. Uh, Theoden, when he's about to ride into his last battle and one of his retainers says to him, you know, we're gonna lose. And he says, I understand that, 
but I intend to meet the enemy on the field of battle anyway. I think if you decide we've lost, then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Is what I'm suggesting, it's a small thing, but small things can lead to big things. What I want to see us doing today, I, 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 again, just to touch on that, I think another aspect of the modern mindset is short-termism. You see it in architecture. The town where I grew up, the bank was made out of sandstone and looked like the Parthenon in Athens. Message was, we were here long before you arrived, sunshine. We're gonna be here long after you've gone. You can trust us with your money. I don't even have a bank building now. I just have a web page that's updated and changed with, with disturbing regularity for those of us who struggle to keep up with such things. Uh, Short-termism. And I think that pervades Christian circles as well. We want to see us, what, what can we do that will solve the problem by next week or next election cycle or 10 years hence? I am with you and I say, okay, the genie's out of the bottle such that we can't solve this in 10 years. We can't solve it in 20 years. We can't solve it in 30 years. But I refuse to believe that we can't push back. I can't help but imagine that if you lived under Stalin in the 1930s, you just said, man, the genie's out of the bottle. Marx was right, the dialectics of history are working in a particular way, there's nothing we can do about it. But that wasn't what was done in the Eastern Bloc. There were pockets of resistance that ultimately bore fruit. So I see our task today as keeping the flame alive for future generations. The analogy I use uh, in class is this, I put up a picture of Cologne Cathedral on the, uh, on the PowerPoint, and I'd say to the students, Cologne Cathedral, they started building it, I think it was 1244, something like that. They finished building it in uh, 1888. Over 600, you've had 650 years to build Cologne Cathedral. Okay, there was a three, 400 year hiatus because of the Reformation and battles and wars, et cetera, et cetera, that the original architects and builders could not have predicted. But what I do know is that the original architects and builders knew that on day one of construction, they would never live to worship God in that magnificent Gothic structure but they still thought it was worth doing. They still did it. And I think our task today is, it can actually be very liberating to say, yeah, the genie's out of the bottle, so we're gonna lose every battle we fight in my lifetime, great, I don't have to worry about winning anymore. I just have to worry about doing the right thing. And I have to worry about keeping the flame alive. <laughs> and, and so my, my, my pushback would be, yeah, we're talking about a day of small things, but let's make sure that we're faithful in that day of small things, that we don't cede ground to the enemy. I first got involved in this because, in this sort of stuff, because in 2015, 2016, my son's gone to the local public schools. The, their favorite teacher there was a very devout Catholic lady, uh, and her husband was a, a lawyer. And her husband called me and said, would you be willing to draft a letter with me to the school board about the new transgender policy that the school board is slipping in quietly that will open bathrooms uh, to biological boys. My wife can't do it. And he said, I can't put my name on it because if I do, her job will be jeopardized. Uh, will you do it? And, and I remember saying to him, I said, you know it'll make no difference, don't you? And he said, yeah, but maybe it'll sow seeds in a few minds. Maybe it's something we can look back on and point to at some point. So we did it. I couldn't, I mean, I sent this everywhere. I even sent it to, I tried to get the local paper to do a sort of front page expose on Truman as hateful bigot. I couldn't get him to pay any attention. But we did it. You can find that letter at First Things now. And to me, yep, that was the moment when I started to push back. It didn't have any effect. But it was the first of many small moments when I pushed back. And if everybody pushes back in their community in the way they can, I have to believe it will make a difference ultimately. We're even seeing some of that in little ways with some of the things that have happened with school boards recently. It can be done. It's just that the other side has been more highly organized and better funded. But we can push back. Uh, so yeah, times are bad. But I also remember a, a comment my friend Rusty Reno said when he asked me to be involved in some mischief on, on some front. And he said, would you, would, you, would you be involved? And I said, well, if you're going to go down fighting, count me in. And he said, oh, I intend to fight, but I don't intend to go down. And I thought, yeah, that's got to be my spirit from now on. <clears throat> Thank you for your speech, Dr. Truman. Um, my question would be, what role has the Protestant, as a Protestant myself, this is me asking a question, so uh, what role has the Protestant Church or the Protestant Reformation played in the creation of the modern self? 
Um, is this endemic, the modern self, uh, endemic to Protestant theology? Yeah. For the individual to be central to their interpretation yeah. of themselves? And the last thing is, what can we do to change the way we see the church and our role in it? Yeah. That's a very good question. And as Keith pointed out to me last night, for many years when First Things had an open comments policy, about a third of the comments on anything I wrote were, yeah, the problems you're defining are all caused by Protestantism. Uh, there is a powerful school of Catholic historiography, though I would say you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily have to be a Catholic to find this historiography compelling. Uh, there's a powerful school of Catholic historiography that tends to see the Reformation as the problem. Brad Gregory would, at Notre Dame would be perhaps one of the most eloquent uh, advocates of this. I think it lies in the background of Charles Taylor, uh, somebody whose work I've benefited from and drawn from uh, very positively. To an extent, it depends on how you frame the Reformation. And you might turn around and say, well, Truman, you're framing the Reformation this way because you're a Protestant. I would say the Reformation is a response to a problem that's already there. The early 15th century papacy is chaos. Protestantism became necessary because Catholicism was such a mess. Now, Protestantism may not be the answer to the problem. As, uh, may not be the answer to the problem, but it isn't the origin of the problem. I think you'd find the origin of the problem in late medieval Catholicism. And the background to late medieval Catholicism is early medieval Catholicism. So if we get into the sort of church blame game, it really depends on, well, where, where, do, you want, where do you want to put your starting point? Uh, maybe individualism was caused by the man who invented the knife and fork. And suddenly people are, are, are able to eat privately rather than all taking stuff out of the communal pot. I mean, there are all kinds of things you can point to. Now, having said that, I do think that Protestantism embodies some tendencies that manifest themselves culturally as problematic. My problem is that I also think they think, bring things that are good and necessary. I would draw an analogy with freedom of religion. Freedom of religion is a good thing. I don't want to live in a nation where there's no freedom of religion. I'm very happy. Uh, I know a lot of Americans don't like America, but I love America and I love living here. It's been very good to me. I'm very grateful to be here. And one of the things that, that is most delightful to me about American history is it was the first really successful project on religious freedom. Uh, a good thing. But it's not an unqualified good thing. Because religious freedom turns religion into something of a consumer choice. Charles Taylor says, you know, you can believe the same today as somebody believed in 1500, but you cannot believe in the same way because you have to choose. And I goad my Catholic friends by saying, even Catholics are Protestants today because you choose to be Catholic. And that's actually a very Protestant thing to do. Now, joking aside, it's true. Freedom of religion tilts religion towards being a consumer commodity. Having said that, all the alternatives are worse. What does Protestantism capture that I think is, is important? It captures a note of personal assurance and it captures the note of the need for a personal existential faith. Now I'm not saying that Catholics don't have those things necessarily. But it seems to me that they became the hallmarks of Protestantism. And they cannot be separated, I don't think, from the kind of problems that we now see with expressive individualism. In other words, I'm, what I'm, uh, in a long and rambling answer, what I'm saying is, yeah, there's a, there's a connection between Protestantism and expressive individualism. Expressive individualism is not all bad. And I would rather have the risk of expressive individualism than lose my ability to preach the urgency of the New Testament when I preach on the New Testament. Howdy, Dr. Truman. Uh, glad you could speak here, and I'm also glad you can refurbish your uh, uh, Texas bourbon collection. So, um, My question deals with, uh, uh, I really latched onto the phrase, the anarchy of feeling, and then in addition to that, when you brought up in an increasingly therapeutic society, nation, church, and family declines while theater and hospital increases. Um, I couldn't help but notice the transitory nature of theater and hospital. Typically, uh, when I think of theater, I think of going and then leaving. 
uh, in addition to a hospital, whereas things like nation, church, and family, um, those are typically lifelong um, uh, institutions or things that you have membership of. Do you feel like in, increasingly, in an increasingly therapeutic society, there is a decrease in the scope in which um, people are members of a, uh, a collection or as you say, uh, sort of a team, like a decrease in the scope of that? I think what we're witnessing at the moment is the emergence of new kind of ways of belonging in new communities. Uh, people still need to belong. It's just that what's replacing the old, more stable communities are things that I think are far less stable and more transient. The LGBTQ movement would be a good example. It's starting to fall apart. The trans issue is, is proving, I think, insurmountable for many in the LGB community. There's been a big law case in the UK in the last week an attempt by a pro-trans group to have a, uh, a, a group that represents lesbians uh, to have their charitable status, their tax-exempt status, removed from them. So I think what we see is you know, people still need to belong. Theater and hospital are not ways of belonging. That's not Reef's point. But we do still need to belong. But the communities that are emerging are far less stable than the old ones. The imagined, you know, I, I like Benedict Anderson's notion of the imagined community. I find that very helpful. When thinking about a nation, for example, why is it that somebody who lives just this side of the Mexican border in Texas thinks of themselves as an American and probably have probably having more in common with somebody from Oregon than somebody who lives half a mile on the other side of the border? Well, that's nothing to do with geography. That's to do with imagination. That's to do with the imagined community to which they belong. What we're seeing is the emergence of imagined communities that are remarkably transient and unstable compared to those which we've had for, for many, many years. Partly, you know, one might trace that back to the instability of narratives now, that the stories people tell are changing all the time. Thank you, Dr. Truman. I think we'll end the questions there. Let's thank him for... Just a couple of uh, remarks here at the conclusion. First of all, there's a reception with light refreshments, basically cookies for 500, just through the doors here to my right in uh, the chapel, um, will be to your left. Um, so please uh, stop by uh, that area. There's also a couple of tables there in that same corridor uh, through these doors that I hope you'll uh, take a moment to look at. One is uh, a stack of books that's provided by our partners at Baker Publishing. So there's some books there, and they've provided uh, cards just for this uh, lecture tonight of discounts. So um, don't take those books, but take a look at them, then take a card for a discount that's good for about a month um, and purchase any books that you like from uh, their catalog. We also have information about the Center for Christian Studies. Uh, primarily, I urge you to check out our website, which is on your program, is also up there on uh, the screen, and explore that website. Um, and stop by our table as well. I invite you to consider subscribing to our journal, the Journal of Christian Studies. Uh, for anyone who, it's three issues a year, for anyone who subscribes uh, to that tonight, you can take home one of the three back issues from this past year, um, and those are all laid out there. Just tell us you've subscribed to it. You can do it on your phone, you can do it on the website, or we can help you with that, and then take home one of these issues. Uh, by the way, the second issue, the whole theme of that issue uh, was sexuality and marriage, and Carl Truman is one of the contributors to that. I have it on really good authority that the coolest kids subscribe to First Things and the Journal of Christian Studies. So uh, take a look at that. We also have Center for Christian Studies uh, Press books that I would uh, categorize in the uh, catechetical genre, uh, good uh, books that teach the basics of the faith that can be used in a variety of settings. Uh, at the Center for Christian Studies, we're grateful to be called to this task of equipping 
Christians uh, with sound theology and for biblical literacy, which I think is needed now more than ever. So if you appreciate what we're doing and the kind of programming that we're offering, an event like tonight, um, I invite you to support what we do. You can go to our website there and uh, find the Give button. Um, and you can do that now or any time or come and talk to me and we can talk about ways that we can partner together in this good work. So um, let me thank the University Avenue Church of Christ for hosting us, for Jordan, our AV guy back there, for Mary and her team who put the refreshments together, for all of my helpers, you know who you are. Let's thank them and Professor Truman again. Thank you. Look for announcements next year. Uh, sign up on our uh, e for email um, updates at our website, and we're dismissed. Go in peace. <laughs>